Welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight to the fifth installment of our guest speaker series. My name is Christian Reisler and I'm a museum specialist here at Frontier Army Museum. And before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to highlight the artifacts that we have on display here. So all of these artifacts are directly related to the Buffalo Soldiers. So that would be the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments and the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments. First up, we have this pattern 1902 dress coat. Uh, this particular coat was worn by a sergeant in the cavalry as evidenced by the rank insignia on the sleeves as well as the yellow piping. Now this jacket belonged to um, a man by the name of Otho Woodward. This is his photo here. And next to the photo is one of his discharge certificates. Mr. Woodward was a quartermaster sergeant in the 10th Cavalry and he was enlisted from 1896 until 1907. And next up, we have these badges that are um, from the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. So these are cap badges. So they would have been worn front and center on the soldier's headwear. That way their affiliation could be easily um, recognized and seen. Next, we have this guide on from Troop L, 9th Cavalry. Now, even though the cavalry's branch color is yellow, their guidons were red and white. And as you can see, this particular guidon is heavily faded and yellowed and stained, but we have had it professionally conserved, so that way um, we can keep further deterioration at a minimum. And then lastly, we have this panoramic photo um, it was taken here at Fort Leavenworth in 1935 um, to commemorate the 68th anniversary of the 10th Cavalry. And as I'm sure a lot of y'all know, the 10th Cavalry was raised here at Fort Leavenworth. Now, for those of you attending in person, after the presentation is over, you're welcome to come up and take a closer look at the artifacts. We just ask that you don't touch anything. That's not only for your safety, but it's also to help preserve the artifacts. So with that, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. George Pettigrew. Mr. Pettigrew is a Navy veteran, and he is currently serving as the Executive Vice President of the Alexander Madison Chapter Kansas City Buffalo Soldiers, and he's also the incoming Vice President of our support organization, Friends of the Frontier Army Museum. And tonight, he's going to be speaking to us and sharing us a story or the history of his great-grandfather, Buffalo Soldier Private Isaac Johnson. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Pettigrew. Thank you, Christian. You're welcome. Howdy, folks. Howdy. 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 Good to be back here. It's been a while. It was quite a while ago, but uh, around 1846. They had to tell me these things because there were no records. But I was born North Carolina. Folks say they'll never forget my birth on that plantation because it happened between two hurricanes. You didn't expect much out of me. I was going to be any good. Those hurricanes were powerful. One was called a Havana hurricane, and it came all the way out of Cuba, killing people all the way into Carolina. And even pushed the water, the salty water, back up the rivers, ruining crops for 100 miles deep from the coast, followed by another one a month later. So everybody, it was, it was bad in the first place, got worse. Food was scarce, transportation was torn up, shipping was closed down, everything was horrible. I don't really remember any of that. I can only remember how people looked at me when they mentioned when I was born, in 46. Two hurricanes in 46. That's not why or how I came to be a soldier. I was born a slave. And I followed all the rules and regulations of being property. I couldn't read, couldn't write. I didn't have ownership of my name. I was called by my master's last name, Clark. So I was Isaac Clark there for a while. Luckily, later on, I got to choose my own name. That's why you don't know me as Isaac Johnson. That was my name. Well, Clark's daughter, Emma, had a little, little girl. And they moved when she married to Montgomery, Alabama. 
think it was bad in North Carolina, Montgomery, Alabama was no better. Not bad thing. But there I was, having a better life. Because instead of living on the plantation doing that work from sun to sundown, six days a week, I was able to work in a hotel, a small one. And Emma was a seamstress. She was the head of the family because unfortunately, Mr. Clark, the husband, died. And so did the father. But Emma was left to raise that baby girl by herself. And really and truly, we became a little bit more like family then because she needed me and I needed her. It's tough. It's hard to understand. But things were the way they were, and I knew nothing else. I had no idea where I was on the map as far as where I was born. And I couldn't point Montgomery, Alabama out on the map, even though that's where I knew I was. But times got even harder. Because you see, I was there in Montgomery when the Civil War broke out. It was kind of a strange feeling, though, because everybody at first thought, oh, this war won't last a couple of few months. We'll be back to normal. But right now, we just need all you men to leave the farm and leave your jobs, leave the cities and leave the towns and go to war. Well, I found that behind. I was healthy. And I was black. And there was no way I was going to be in a war. Not with a weapon, not with other troops. But what I was able to do, and I stayed because Emma Clark couldn't do without me. I was bringing in money to support the family just like she was. And her daughter at that time was only four years old. She remarried. She remarried a guy from Philadelphia. Now, you can still hear the talk around Montgomery about that time because people just didn't know why would this good Southern woman marry that game. It wasn't easy for her. It really did change quite a few things. He was what they call a huckster. I mean, he just sold things, goods of all kinds, whatever he could pick up, he'd turn it in, turn it over for cash. That was what he did. And I, by that time, working in the hotel, it's no general duty, just whatever I was told, that's what I did. Well, it worked out well for me, because I heard something. I heard it was January. 1863, that President Lincoln had put out an emancipation. And it was supposed to be about me, but I tell you, as I look around, nothing changed. As a matter of fact, things got a little worse because people were afraid what would happen. As bad as things were, what was going to happen if all the slaves were taken away? Or if they ran away? What would happen? Things were bad enough, it was hard to believe it could be any worse. But they imagined it would be so. It was very, very uncomfortable at that time. I think everything I did was watched. Every move I made, someone was watching. I couldn't talk to other black people on the street. I could nod, make quick eye contact, drop my head and move on. But you didn't become familiar with anyone around you because you couldn't trust anyone either, no matter what. But I did hear something that I couldn't believe. The United States Army, this was around 1865, going on 1866 by that time. The U.S. Army had moved into the South. There wasn't much of anything left by that time anyway. Everything was in ruin. Everything. Times were harder than they ever been. There was no hope. You white folks weren't gonna find it easy either. There were no jobs, no money, no prospects, no opportunities. If you think it was hard on you, there was nothing left over for me. I wasn't going to do what I was doing before the war ended. I wasn't going to do anything at all. 
Because when them white folks can't find a job, ain't no job for them. Except those that they just absolutely would not take. Those jobs were taken too. But what I heard was too amazing to believe. How could it be, since I never could learn to read or write, since I never knew what freedom was, since every movement I ever made was watched, recorded, and reported, and to stay out of trouble, I had to walk the line. But now, they're talking about black folks going into the army. This is ridiculous. Why? Because the war is over. It's peacetime. Besides that, the United States had never enlisted black troops when there wasn't a war. Now get this straight too. This is as I understand it. You never got yourself into a problem in the United States that black folks weren't there helping you get yourselves out of it. In whatever way, they were there. We've heard about the folks, what was it? Boston? First got shot, first got killed. Black. Some of the heroes of the Revolutionary War, I found out much later, were black. They fought in every major battle from the Revolutionary War you can name. These guys were there. In the boat with Washington, crossing the Delaware. Somehow, I felt so forgotten. So I saw this opportunity that came to me in Montgomery, Alabama, as an opportunity not to serve that flag that had never cared for me, not to serve a nation that didn't love me back, but to prove my worth as a man. I went in service. I went to fight. I went to make this country better so I could prove myself as a citizen. Trust me, when I joined, I couldn't go. I wasn't a citizen. But the opportunity to serve was too good to believe, but also too good to pass up. So when I heard this from that same old huckster that Emma Clark had married, then I found out it was true. And since he was from Philadelphia, he was telling me of what we call the down low. Nobody's walking around announcing, nobody's putting handbills on the side of buildings telling you a thing about it. I honestly believe, had I been found out about going to join the Army, it may have been the end of my life. No one wanted to see a black man wearing blue. But that was life. I took the opportunity. I got out of Montgomery as soon as I could. And I found myself in Jefferson Barracks. Well, that was outside St. Louis at that time. That's where we went to join up. And I did, I signed it. May 6th, 1867. Honestly, in my mind, I was still a slave. But I knew something was different because no one treated me like a slave anymore. But then they handed me a uniform. Oh, there's an old jacket, old pair of pants, and Best boots I've had in my life. And when I looked at it, and I saw that there were buttons of gold. In the US, on the hat they gave me. First time I ever had clothes that match. Tell you the truth, I've never seen anything like that. There were no stripes on it, nothing. All of this I earned later. But what I did was, I marched. It was tough. It was very tough. A lot of malaria, a lot of diseases. I even heard tell of some folks that were so desperate to just get one of those jobs with the Army, they walked from South Carolina to Louisiana. Oh, that's bad. But you gotta imagine you walked across South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi to get to Louisiana. None of that was a picnic. None of those places were welcome. You were on your own, and you might as well have been a runaway, because you sure wanted to stay out of sight. 
crossing those, crossing the South, the heart of the South, the heart of the South after the Civil War. And you say, and we're going to tell him that I'm going to join the Army. Yeah, that's where I'm going. No, you wouldn't. You had to lie your way across the South. And everybody that was in what became the Buffalo Soldiers started off in Louisiana. Today's Audubon Park in New Orleans. You know what's funny? Going to New Orleans, even the folks there don't know that. They think it's Audubon Park. They didn't know that's where the 9th, 39th Infantry, 40th and 41st Infantry, plus the 9th Cavalry, all were raised there. Here, the lucky folks came. They were with the tent. Believe it or not, all the story I tell you is about the folks that were here first. Because the folks that were here first, these were the ones that were first called wild buffalo. Uh, the Native Americans, the Plains Indians, the, the Cheyenne. They're the ones that gave them their name. It was amazing. And even though they weren't treated well here, sorry to say, Truth has got to live. We had a garrison commander that just refused to accept black folks in the presence of his white soldiers or of his white boy. Didn't want. So when the request was, can we put down planks because you put us down in the swamp, which if you know where that statue is, it's about a thousand yards ahead of that statue. That was a low land that they put them in. More mosquitoes, more malaria, more everything you didn't want to be a part of. Dysentery, diarrhea, you name it, they got it. But that was where they had to live. So when they had to put down planes, even inside the tent, no. Can we put in planes at least so we can walk back and forth? No. It even went so far that when they had orders, and Colonel Grierson was very happy to leave, he, he did not like the treatment that his soldiers he, he raised the tent right here. But he did not appreciate the mistreatment. Even on the parade field, when the black soldiers went out there, the white companies would do an about face and stand with their backs to the parade field. Okay, all that's a little bitty stuff. But I'll tell you this it's like that torture of a thousand cuts. Every little bit hurts. And then pretty soon it hurts more and more. And then it gets to a point where it no longer hurts. It makes you more determined to end that behavior. We weren't going to confront anybody about it. That was going to be certain trouble for us. What we did do, we went out there and we performed. And we practiced. And we did so well that it was hard to ignore. We were able to leave here, finally, blessed. We were able to leave here. We were on our way to Fort Riley. One more, just to inflict one more little insult. This garrison commander says, everyone, every regiment that moves out, they have a crew of laundry people with them. These are civilians. And they make money. As a matter of fact, these laundries made more money than soldiers did. Many soldiers were very happy to marry these laundries. Because while they were making $13 a month, incidentally, white soldiers made 15 While they were making $13 a month, there were people to marry a laundress, she was making $20 or more per month. And it was good food, good cooking. It was a place away from the fort. They always had the house right outside the fort. Grierson told me, Commander, okay, we're, we're leaving. And the commander says, you're not taking your laundry with you. Which meant that the soldiers outside of their own duty, drilling, taking care of their horses, and doing everything, also were going to have to do their own laundry. These guys weren't equipped to do that. They couldn't sew. Nor did they have the equipment to sew. Grayson says, yes, sir. I went and told the laundry, we're leaving today. You're not going with us. So I tell you what. Get your stuff, get your kettles, get your wagons, get everything loaded up right now, and you leave ahead of us. 
be now. Well, they were feeling pretty bad. They were being mistreated too. And then he told them quite quietly, leave that port by the front gate, go to the right, and wait. And against garrison commander's orders, when the 10th Cavalry left here, going to Fort Riley, in 1867, he took the lunges with him. He defied his commander, who was no longer his commander, because he was going around. So he said, boo boo on that guy, and took off. They took them with him, and they stayed with him. They got to Riley, and there were other problems, pretty much the same as it was here. There wasn't very much difference in the way that they were treated anywhere. No place was really accepting of them. But once they got to Riley, things worked a little better. Because you see, this place, this was the crown jewel of everything that was about the West and about conquering the West, and about taming the West, and about the old West in general. This was the Department of Missouri, and it covered everything out the Rocky Mountains and as far as the Pacific Ocean. North Canada, frankly, sometimes into Canada, illegally, and down into Mexico as well. And this was a chief supply point. They ran everything. All the reports, all those Western ports were funneled through here. Then old Sherman was in charge of the Division of Missouri. Well, those guys got out there, and a detachment was soon sent from Fort Riley. And this I want you to know. It was on the ride from Fort Riley to Fort Larned. Fort Larned, Kansas, West Kansas. Next to and in the middle of nothing. But on the way there, those black troops on horseback from the 10th Cavalry, and I'll tell you this, they weren't given the best, and they certainly were not given first choice on the stock or on the equipment. Saddles, bags, equipment, none of them got it first. They got what was left. But on the way to Fort Harker, excuse me, not Fort Harker, Fort Warren, they had to engage war parties twice. Those were the first engagement of those black, regular, peacetime soldiers in any of the enemy of the West. Those are the same guys that left here. First engagement. And they were successful in both. Now, that makes me want to take you back a little bit. You might ask, okay, so when was the first time black soldiers were faced with fighting for the United States? Do you know that happened here too? There's a place over in Missouri, just across the Missouri line, the Missouri Kansas border, in Bates <coughs> County, Missouri. That's Butler, it's a township there. A few miles west of Butler, it's what they call the Toothman Farm. And Miss Toothman was the only one trying to keep that farm together because her husband and her sons, they were all sympathetic to the Confederates. And even her baby boy had been picked up by federal troops and put in prison as a spy. So now you might imagine how very, very welcoming Miss Toothman was some black soldiers, 240 of them, marched up that road and turned onto her property. And she's watching this. And now, take your mind back. As a matter of fact, relieve yourself of everything you know right now. And be that white woman standing on that porch, watching 240 people carry rifles on their shoulders, United States flag out in front of them, officers on horses, and they're marching in formation and they turn onto your property. I think she was ready to escape. She knew she couldn't get them all. So she just stood there defiantly. Commander dismounted, came up on the porch and spoke to her. And he asked, we understand that there are rebel guerrillas here. 
Our mission is that we want to contain the rebel guerrillas in the area. And I'll tell you this, you gotta respect the rebel, especially a guerrilla. They fight for themselves. They don't follow any chain of command, except their own. As a man, they call this battle. So when the commander says, Ms. Tubman, we understand that these guerrillas are here in the area. Do you know anything about them? She said, yep. Yeah. Says, well, what can you tell me? She says, oh, they're over that rise down there. They're on Hog Island. Hog Island was no little place. Three miles long, a mile wide, in between two streams, two deep streams. Hog Island, that was their heaven. They had all of their supplies, their horses, their cooking, their tents, everything. And whatever they had that they wanted or needed, they took. That's why they had friends and not so many friends everywhere. Because it didn't matter which side you believed in. If you had a hand, that was all the food you had left. And even if they couldn't use it, they might burn your feet, burn your barn. Just dead. So now these black troops, they were a little bit upset too. You know, because these guys are bad. Guys, they're all on horseback, we're on foot. <coughs> Ms. Tuchman said that there was maybe five to seven hundred of them down on Hog Island. There were only 240 of the black soldiers. They've never been tested, never been in battle. Oh, they learned how to shoot a rifle, all right. But no one was shooting back. So this they thought was going to be a disaster. So Ms. Tuchman felt a little bit better after she talked to that commander. She said, these guys are going to be wiped out in a minute. Now, in a war situation, don't you ever think that you're going to sneak up a road and no one knows you're there? They knew. They knew that black troops had come across that border. They knew that they were in the area. They probably figured out why. Well, let's wrap this story up. In order to survive, you have to be able to sustain yourself. No grocery stores, no deliveries. Nobody's going to come by and serve popcorn and hot dogs. You already know. So you better go out and you have to forage to find out what you can about the area, reconnaissance, and what it can provide that you can live on. Well, the commander of the black troops told me, don't go out of sight of that ridge. You just go out there and take a look around and see what you can see. Incidentally, this was the first Kansas colored volunteers. That's who they were. Now, there's a back story to that. I'm going to be brief about this. A senator, United States Senator, Jim Lane, was a rebel himself. Only he wore blue, and he was a man. He was a general and a senator. He was authorized to raise troops. There was no policy to raise black troops. Jim Lane, Jim Lane said, the heck with that. You know, these healthy fellows, and they keep coming. Get them some uniforms, get them some guns, get them out there. You practice them, get them ready. He raised two regiments. He even had a black officer. Jim Lane was wide open, y'all. Different from anything you would imagine. So he sent a telegram to Washington and told Lincoln and, and Secretary Stanton of the War Department that he had these regiments, two of them. First Kansas color and the second Kansas color, both volunteers. And he was going to put them in the battle. Well, I guess that the response from Lincoln and Stanton didn't arrive soon enough. And Jim Lincoln took that as a good sign. And he marched those fellas off. The story ended this way. There was a battle out of the mountain. 240 against 500 or more. Infantry foot soldiers against seasoned horseback riders. Good horsemen, armed to the teeth. They had been in that battle for years. They knew, they were experienced. Those black soldiers were not. So when they broke out of those parties, a few of them went a little bit too far. And it was an opportunity for the guerrillas to attack. 
and little parties and trying to pick them off, trying to break them up because in their head they knew if we fire these guys, they're going to scatter. They're not. They're not. They can't stand it for us. Too much confidence. I think that worked against them. Because after they had fought, they fought again, and some fields were set on fire, the black soldiers figured out on the spot to set backfires. That hadn't been done. Set backfires to keep from being burned alive and fight through the fire and the smoke. Well, there were injuries, there were some deaths. One kid that was 15 years old came back and he was bandaged from his wound. And he was very proud when he told his commander, I didn't kill anybody, but I brought my gun back. To him, I meant everything. Here's what surprised America. It was only a day or so after the engagements were over that Hog Island was empty. Gone. Quit fighting and left. Left nothing behind. Well, of course, the story goes out now. First of all, black troops are out there fighting white Confederates, guerrillas. They were not regular army. but it was counted as a victory. Now, if you're familiar with the movie Glory, it'll leave you the idea that even though the black troops of the Massachusetts 54th in South Carolina were annihilated, yeah, that's true. But it leaves the impression that that was the first time black troops and whites had fought on different sides of that war. That's what's not true. First time with the soldiers that came here. First time with the ones that marched down Military Road toward Fort Scott and crossed over to Missouri. Harper's Weekly wrote it up. And the man in Butler said they fought like tigers. Well, personally, I'm glad that we're not tiger soldiers. I kind of like being a buffalo soldier better. Even though at first they called us wild buffalo. That didn't work well either. Wild buffalo. But sometimes leave it to the press and it can actually improve things. They started calling them wild buffalo, buffalo soldiers. They were slow to catch on, but they had letters from the wives of the lieutenants that were stationed where black troops were. And they were riding home and writing these stories. And of course, when the letters got back home, they were spread around the community as well. Buffalo soldiers. Even today, it is my understanding that if I were to go to a powwow, anyone, and mention that I was Buffalo people, the Native Americans still today understand exactly who you're referring to. Let me read this to you. Because it really did amaze me. I don't have all my glasses, so you, you're going to laugh at me the way I, I stumble through these words, but I'm going to try my best. It says, you ended your story, the story of Kathy Williams, who says, Lily was a black woman that joined and successfully marched. For 22 months, she was incognito. She was a soldier. Now, they say, Kathy, you look like a man. She must have been a pretty hard living woman. <clears throat> I was low suspected for 22 months until their help just wouldn't hold up. And she let them discover that William Cafe was a woman. Now, this is Army thinking. Hey, I'm a Navy veteran, so you can get mad at me later. But this at the time was Army thinking. Who walked into that doctor's office as William Cafe walked out as a woman. And they said, no, no, that's not right. And accused her of fraud. She never had a discipline problem. <coughs> never had a problem whatsoever. But anyway, in the way from Kathy, it says, you ended the story of Kathy by saying that you did not know where the term Buffalo soldiers came from. 
my ancestors, and this is written by a Native American, had no name to talk about their experience and first contact with melanin-rich black people. They observed how tough and hardy blacks were and named them for the pantheon of token attributes and the buffalo most closely embodied, embodied who they were looking at. Depending on the tribe, the buffalo has different attributes. Some tribes' considerations are courage, leaders, and warriors. I haven't heard which tribe coined the term, but assuredly, if you say buffalo people at a powwow, everyone will get who you refer to. The author is unknown. That came through a producer at KCUR Radio, who had done a story with me, and later on contacted me about what she had heard in response to that story about Kathy Williams and Buffalo Soldiers. That answers the problem for me, because an oppressed people is out there oppressing another people. Why would blacks fight Indians? Truth is, they had no choice. In service, if you did not do as commanded, you'd be lucky to be arrested and could be shot. And it would have destroyed not only the morale, but the reputation of those Buffalo soldiers, the black soldiers. Did you know this? That those black troops, as poorly as they were treated sometimes, and they were happy to be called Buffalo Soldiers because I've been called some other things, brunette, so forth and so on, that wasn't flattering. Never was meant as a compliment. But they took that name, which was supposed to be one of shame, because they said, well, it has to do with your hair, the your color of your skin. Well, that's true. But you had a lot of gray haired guys out there, too. Everybody wasn't like they are today. A 19 year old guy that's out there joining the army. You had old grown folks like me. And we stayed there for 30 years. It was the best thing we could do. It was the best place we could be. Well, it just so happened that because of this need for approval, the lowest desertion rate and the lowest discipline rate over alcoholism belonged to the black troops throughout the West and down into Texas and Mexico. The lowest desertion, the lowest alcoholism. And I was deep about the alcohol, because if you've been to some of those sports, my goodness, drinking would be a relief. There was absolutely nothing. And some of the towns were very capable, like Hayes, Kansas, relied on that form. They said Hayes was one of the roughest spots you could find in the West back in the 1880s. It was a bad place. Killings were all the time. So when you hear about Dodge, yeah, they got the reputation. But the truth lies somewhere else. It was tough, very tough. And one of the things I'm most proud of, knowing that Isaac Johnson was illiterate, totally, Nothing funny about it, but when he signed his, let's say the truth, when he made his mark on his first enlistment papers in 1867, his commander signed the line that he's supposed to sign. His commander, the guy to recruit, the officer, signed the line. Well, it's just my assumption, but my great grandfather must have figured that's where you put your name. And he made an X right in between the officer's name on the same line. He knew how, he never had a contract. Never knew what a contract, couldn't read it if, if he did have one. Never had business dealings, except on a small basis. You were allowed to make money, but that money went to him apart. He was getting money for his first time. Here's something that was unique and special to Buffalo Soldier Troops. The chaplain that was assigned to the companies and the regiments 
move with the regiment. If the regiment stayed, the chaplain stayed. That was different for the black soldiers because their chaplains were charged with teaching them how to read and write. You try that on, okay? This is a big hat, and I'm gonna blow my head right out of this hat. Because the same thing had been outlawed all his life was now being taught and given, and patience was made for them to learn how to do something that they knew always as illegal. Very special. Army never did it for or after, just for those black troops. It moves my soul today that on his reenlistment paper in 1878, I saw where he signed his name. Did it work? Progress. You know, you gotta look at it like progress, but if you, I look at it this way, and I propose to you the same thing. It was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, human experiment the United States ever endeavored, and the most successful. Because you took people that can read, write, for nothing but property. No law against murdering one of them. It wasn't murder. Something happened that they had to move on. Bought and sold. Families ripped apart. You really didn't have a family. Only as long as it was permitted. And yet and still, these people went from being slaves but you didn't even understand the concept of freedom to being soldiers. Then on to being some of the better soldiers out west. Then on to being the most decorated. When it comes to Congressional Medal of Honor, there's nothing greater than a person in service, no matter what their rank is, top to bottom, flag officer, down to a butt crowd. There's nothing above a Medal of Honor. The black troops received more Congressional Medal of Honor during the Indian Wars than all the other troops come out. And there were only 20% of the cavalry. There were 10% of the infantry. This is where you go from being a slave to being a soldier, to being an excellent soldier. Low desertion. Low discipline. You took care of your animals and your stock. You took care of yourself. You did your mission. And you were recognized, which was hard to do, for being one of the best in the field for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Y'all forgive me. That's, that's, that's a journey that I don't think there's anything like it. I don't think there's anything that's ever occurred in the history of the United States of America that has had a journey further than that. That's why I call it a human experiment. And that's why I say to you, it was a success. And you're witness to that. I want to tell you something. Don't think I'm talking to you, my folks. I'm talking with you. Why? Because it could have been your ancestors as well that were one of the officers. The first 11 years, there was not one black officer anywhere in the West. Not one. Flipper Wilson. Flipper Wilson, isn't that? That's crazy. Henry Osman Flipper. Well, that was not. Stop that. I feel bad enough. It was the first one to come out of West Point. First black. It wasn't the first one to go, just the first one to finish. You know what it took for him to finish? Four years of solitude. No one would speak to him. He didn't room with anybody, he didn't study with anybody, he didn't eat with anybody. And you try four years of silence. We do that now in prison. Solitary confinement. I will tell you a backstory about that too. Michael was good at engineering. In those courses, he was very good. Matter of fact, down in Fort Sale, Oklahoma, today, 
he created a way to drain a swamp that had been a disease disaster for Fort Sill, as long as Fort Sill had never been on that location. He engineered a way to drain that swamp to flow up the incline. It's called Flipper's Ditch today, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. He did something. This commander of the, of the fort said, yeah, go ahead. I'll be as crazy as you can be. And he did. That's how great it was. So, backstory about them not being able to study with anybody. I heard that there were knocks at the door at late at night. And uh, can I get some notes? Can I borrow the book? Don't tell anybody I'll tell you. He was helping out the students. But in public, they were ordered not to speak to him. If anyone wants to speak to him, it was in the line of duty. Four years he did that. You wouldn't believe it. But if you've ever heard of the teapot devil, he was involved in that too, as an engineer. Second guy came out of Arkansas. He graduated. Most unheard of of all, David Alexander. John David Alexander. From a place called Helena, Arkansas, down on the Mississippi River, a tough place to be, y'all. Because he had no problems, he's not one you hear about. You hear about the first, and you hear about the third, Charles Young. Charles Young was a colonel, a main major, but uh, went on to be a colonel and was the first, one of the very first superintendents of the National Park Service. He was in Yosemite, Sequoia, and King. And when they sent those black troops in there, and they sent him with infantry people. Remember infantry walks. They put those infantry guys on horseback out there in that park. They said, listen, we've had other troops out here. We've had other commands out here. We're trying to get roads back into the back country so we can open this park up to the public. So far, in a year, less than a mile have been cleared. The year following the black soldiers' arrival, they had three miles cleared into the park. Also had to do with that park, and this is one of the branches of Buffalo soldiers, you had your first smoke jumpers. They called themselves the Triple Nipple, the 555 five, five paratroops. They wouldn't call them paratroops, because white guys were paratroops. These were smoke jumpers, which is a fool's business, because you're jumping out of an airplane with a parachute and a shovel into a fire. Folks weren't doing that. And guess what? They weren't telling the American public, because they didn't want them to know that Japan was floating high-altitude balloons that would drop incendiaries into the forest to set them on fire. They did not want to let America become alarmed by that. So they sent these black guys in there and said, we're not reporting on that. Nope. And you're not parachutes. Get that straight. You're a smoke jumper. Now today, anybody that jumps out of a plane in a flimsy little parachute, it's a parachute. So in every way, it was somehow denial, pushback, and in many cases, just not telling the whole story. Know this, I never tell black history. I don't. I tell American history. But my joy is I get to tell you the stuff you haven't heard. Why? Because someone decided that it was just too difficult to explain how a non-person, and even legally three-fifths of a person, could do these distinguished things. Folks like Colin Powell said he wouldn't be who he was if it wasn't for Buffalo Soldiers. And I'm thankful to him that he put that monument here. He knew. He was smart enough to know that there was a street named 9th Cavalry and one named 10th Cavalry, something's going on. And he never let that idea go. And I want to introduce to you a new idea. 
and they're good for anything. We're going to close with them on Colin Powell's story. There are eight statues out there. That is the National Buffalo Soldier Monument. Eight statues, Colin Powell's in the middle, and they're 13 foot bronze. Oh, did you know the same guy that did that horse and rider and Colin Powell? That statue is the same guy that put the statue in at West Point a few months back. And it gets so the connection goes on and on and on. But what I want you to know tonight is that you won't be meeting in this building for much longer. Quit smiling so hard, Chris. <laughs> We're building a new museum. The 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association a national organization of 21,000 members and some 40 chapters nationwide is spearheading a public-private partnership between the United States Army, the Center of Military History, the Frontier Museum. All of us are working together to build something that in all the history of the Army has never been tried but twice. And that is to have a public-private partnership to build a museum on federal land outside the fence line. So it's easy for everyone to come. Everyone can visit and find these stories and learn more. And maybe if they learn more about the Buffalo Soldiers, somehow they might learn more about themselves. Because I'll tell you this, in this room, everybody's a Buffalo Soldier. You got it here the determination, the grit, the won't quit, obstacles or opportunities. My daddy always told me, don't say you can't. You make it twice as hard. But now you gotta overcome can't and make can happen. That's a Buffalo Soldier spirit. I'll finish with this. I'm here with you today because I knew a Buffalo Soldier when I was Little bitty boy, I had no idea. Even the name didn't make sense. A bubble of humor, I, I couldn't see. But I knew this. My mother knew that her grandfather was one of the first, very early on. And uniquely, he was with the infantry in the very beginning with the 38th, the first infantry regiment raised. He was on board in the 30th when they reorganized again, and he became part of the 24th. And later on, re enlisted and was part of the 9th. Now, I didn't set these up, but, <laughs> but I can't help but point that out. He wore that insignia. His flag was 9th Cavalry K Company, the company immediately before this company that's displayed here, L. For her 40 years of work, which she willed to me when she passed in 2008, she received the United States flag that was flown over the United States Capitol in honor of her grandfather and was issued a citation and a resolution from the 107th Congress Second Session that referred to her grandfather as a true patriot, words he never heard. So I thank you for listening to a very long winded, very roundabout story, because there's really no way to tell you all about the Buffalo Soldiers. But I will say this, because it surprises me. Buffalo Soldiers from the age to end, from the Indian Wars to Korea, 85 years. That's all they existed. And then they were no more. Lincoln started what led to Buffalo Soldiers. And our own good home fella here, Harry Truman, put an end to it. But he signed an executive order. And remember this, the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. The president took his authority to do that. That started what became the opportunity for Buffalo Soldiers. And it was Harry Truman that signed an executive order, 9981 that ended the integration by separation or segregation. They said, you're going to serve together. As a veteran, I know we wore the same 
lousy uniforms, and they, well, we ain't better than they did. We did the army. That's the only reason I went. But uh, they really did make that difference in 85 years of your people. You're here because you've heard of them. You're here because you know about them. But I'm just wondering if you knew they lasted one good lifetime. That is all. And now they're world famous. And the one thing I take from it personally, I'm going to offer this person and I'm done. It gives me the strength to know that my contribution, my heritage is raising the West, being a part of those things I thought I was never a part of, taming the West. Growing up in the Delta South during Jim Crow, none of these things meant to me. I was never included in that. I couldn't see myself in that. I couldn't go to a movie, a magazine, a book, even the black library that they had, which was the size of this room. I couldn't go in there to find very much that had to do with me. But finding out about Isaac Johnson and that he never fought for the flag or for the stars and stripes. He fought for his individual dignity to know that he was more than property or simply a son. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. We have a moment. Any questions? How are we doing on time? About three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Give me any questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You mentioned about uh, changing the name of Clark to Johnson. Yes. When and how did that happen? Well, he actually got the name himself. And so did a lot of other former enslaved people. And it happened that I know of um, somewhere after Montgomery. Okay. And by the time he got to Jefferson Barracks, which was a train wreck. So he enlisted as Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He enlisted as Isaac Johnson. By that time, he'd already changed his name. But of course, it was just an X. Someone else wrote Isaac Johnson. The train tracks that go down the side the sport today, those are the tracks that he came from Jefferson Barracks right through here in 1867. And in September of 1867, he took a bullet in the shoulder and a surprise attack doing what black soldiers did, guarding the US mail between Fort Harker and Fort Union, New Mexico. It was Cow Creek where he was wounded. And there was no turning back. That bullet, that wound, they patched him up. Put that shell, that rifle back on the shoulder, put it on top of that wagon, and said, move on. He wasn't treated properly until he got to Fort Union, New Mexico, another 460 miles later. I couldn't take a paper cut that long. <laughs> I'm not a chicken, I just don't like pain. Any other questions? Well, listen, thanks again. I appreciate your attention. And I will say this too, and I mean this honestly. I know that you gave your time, which is valuable. Your time is valuable to you. And for you to come here and allow me to have some of your valuable time, I can only hope that what you've experienced here tonight added value to the time you gave. Thank you again. Yes,